morning. Our theme this month is wisdom. And so I've been thinking about the wisdom of the crowd that I belong to, about this crowd in front of me and the UU crowds that raised me and raised my children, about how being part of this crowd continues to enlighten me and promotes a greater sensitivity to each of you and to the people who make up our larger community. And how that wisdom that we surround ourselves with here helps each of us to continue to bend that moral arc. I'm a privileged white chick. I'm quoting a good friend of mine who didn't use the word chick. It was something sounds more like rich. <laughs> but I'm going to be family friendly here. My friend recently found herself living with and depending on a small crowd, a new crowd. Those she was living with were young and old. They were men and women. They were of color and white. And many of them would not consider themselves having come from privilege. But all of them found themselves in the same very difficult life situation. My friend had a white middle class Midwestern upbringing she spent two middle school years in Switzerland, taught elementary school, earned two advanced degrees, and put her career on hold to raise children. She raised three of them, who are now adults. They overachieved, they graduated college, and they've started their privileged adulthood. What she found in the middle of a desperate situation, and different from many of her then peers, was that she had the love of family and friends who would take her in, support her any way they could. And she realized that they could support her because they had jobs. They had houses and bank accounts and 401ks. And she had health insurance on the day that she most needed it. And that is, and that is privilege, she realized. And she said to me, wrapping up some of what she learned in that place, I really am a privileged white chick. I'm a privileged white chick. I have all of that. I have a job that I love. It pays well. I have a comfortable house, love and support, a 401k, and health insurance. I have friends and family who would and could take me in. And for most of my life, I thought everyone had those things. Or I didn't stop really to realize just how much I had. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., just a block from the Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is now Walter Reed. Inconvenience to my family was the traffic backing up every time the president had to get a physical. I'm a privileged white chick. Just a half a mile from that house, if you cut through Rock Creek Park and underneath the Beltway overpass, was the Unitarian Church where I grew up. In 1961, the year I was born, my parents moved to that house. It was coincidental to the house church distance that they had been married at the first Unitarian Church in Philadelphia a few years before. And even more coincidental, 1961 was the year that the Universalists and the Unitarians decided to call their long-term courtship a marriage. And Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church is where I spent my first 30 years. Growing up, I was part of the LRY, which was Liberal Religious Youth, and teaching Sunday school in my 20s. I was one of those few who kind of stuck around after high school and college. This was my crowd and there was tons of wisdom there. It was there that my parents and my minister and my mailman coordinated a sort of church exchange with the inner city Salem Baptist Church Choir. It was there that I ate collard greens and chitlins the day of the Poor People's March. It was there that I learned about contraception, about other religions, about how to do an auction for church fundraising, and it was there that we fed and housed the homeless, as we do here at VUU. 
When I was 30, I moved to Colorado Springs with my husband and my six-month-old baby. I didn't know it then, but I found out later that I had another one on the way, so my hormones were raging. I remember the day when I understood that we lived in the literal shadow of focus on the family, with all that meant about the people who lived around me now and with whom I was sharing offices and daycares and restaurants and Walmarts. I cried. I cried a lot. And I was kind of an inconsolable one afternoon when my husband got home from work and he found me huddling in the big chair with my baby and I cried out, why on earth did you move us here? <laughs> this place is awful. Do you know they're asking us to vote on a constitutional, a Colorado state constitutional amendment that will explicitly allow discrimination against gays? This was one, a big one, of the reasons that I knew I was not among my crowd anymore. I grabbed the yellow pages and I looked up Unitarian Universalist and I said, you take care of the baby, I'm going to church on Sunday. And I did, I went alone and I was walked into the sanctuary and I was really surprised because it had stained glass windows and it had dark wood pews and I had this 30 year frame of reference, that's not what a UU church <laughs> looked like. I was not sure if I was in the right place. So imagine my relief when a man walked in from the back of the sanctuary, came up to the altar carrying a big bushel of apples and he was wearing uh, overalls. He started to discuss the morning's apple communion. I had never heard of Apple Communion, you probably haven't either, but I knew from that moment that this was my crowd. <laughs> and there was great comfort in that. We moved several times, and I found both comfort and great wisdom in the small crowd of the Boise UU Fellowship and the tiny Dahlonega Georgia Church in the Mountains at a mid-sized Roswell Georgia Church and then here at Valley UU, where I've been for 13 years. Reverend Andy mentioned recently that tolerance, just tolerance, is not our goal. 20 years ago, you used claimed tolerance and inclusion, but our congregation in Georgia had not done all the work. We found out when the members had major disagreements about whether to put a rainbow flag outside. They had accepted LGBTs officially, and they'd even become a welcoming congregation with all that that entails. But at that time, they were not prepared to come out to their community. In that same year, a very wise member of the Roswell Church gave a soul-bearing sermon. Janet spoke that morning about the disappointment and the fear that she felt and expressed when her daughter came out as a lesbian. She wanted to have been accepting, loving, way beyond tolerant. And instead, she asked her daughter, is this a phase? Could you try dating men maybe? Could you wait to make this decision? She grieved out loud for grandchildren she'd never have. She spent a long time recovering from that grief, but eventually it was not about having a lesbian daughter. Her grief was now over her response to her daughter for thinking and saying things that were not supportive. Theoretically, she supported gays and lesbians, but in her life it turned out she had not been prepared. I still remember clearly sitting there that day. My girls were about six and seven and they were over in Sunday school. And I wondered if one of them came out to me one day would I be prepared? I did a little math, because I'm a math girl. I had about a 20% chance of that happening. So I decided I should be prepared, just in case. I was oddly intentional, for no apparent reason other than how Janet's disappointment in herself struck something inside of me. I took part in pride marches while my kids were growing up. I learned what I could. 
And when my college freshman daughter told me she was a lesbian, I handled it a little bit better than Janet had. Because of Janet, and because she shared her hard-earned wisdom, I was better prepared way beyond the theoretical. And I have been so grateful ever since for Janet's bravery that morning. Everything I've really needed to know, I've learned from Unitarian Universalists, from my crowd, from you. You have made me a better person, a better parent. You were my village, raising my kids to the amazing adults they've become. And I realized too that being part of this community adds to my privilege. We are whiter and wealthier as a denomination than just about any other. In the course of writing this sermon, I was in the company of educators and board members listening to students tell us about the Tempe Youth Town Hall and their investigation into and discussion of racism and privilege and promoting dialogue about microaggressions. Two board members admitted that they had never heard the term microaggression. My first thought was, what are you living under a rock? And then I realized that of course they weren't, but they probably didn't spend 20 hours a week listening to MSNBC and Bill Maher and NPR and Reverend Andy. They probably had never heard of Tennessee Coates. And I admit for a minute, I felt somewhat superior, more evolved, But during the next week, as I was writing here about my experiences and the wisdom of my crowd, I came to realize and understand and own a somewhat extraordinary use or abuse of my white privilege and to write about it here. You see, four years ago, I decided to run for the Tempe Union High School Governing Board. I had been on the board for four years and I'd been off for two, and I was ready to do it again. There were two other Democrats running. It's a nonpartisan race, but that's significant. <laughs> People who I knew and whose views I agreed with. And I thought that we could possibly get two of us elected, but it would be harder for each of these newcomers to win over the others who were running partly because they were unknown. I also knew, and never said out loud, that one being African American and the other one having dark Eastern skin and a difficult to pronounce other sounding name would be a detriment to their candidacies. I wanted to win and to be back on the board. I wanted to be doing more good work on behalf of our students. And so, I used my photograph on my campaign signs that said, re-elect Deanne McClenahan. I told myself then, and in the years since, that I did it to remind people who I was. Because in the years since my last campaign and board service, my last name had changed, but my face really had not. I was, I believed, the better candidate, and I wanted to make sure people knew and remembered who I was. Today, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, and I'm humbled. I had to use all those words because there wasn't one that really sums up how I felt, how I feel, to admit here today that I crossed a line. Using my photo did not fall in the category of microaggression was more of a macro aggression. Flaunting my ancestry, along with McClenahan, my husband's Irish name, knowing that would help, what would help defeat them, that the skin color of these people who I considered friends, I was now using to win an election. I believe then, I think I believed then, that I was doing it for the right reasons, 
but I've come to learn that if something gnaws at you, if you feel a need to explain something multiple times, you just might want to take a closer look. Check your intentions, check your conscience, but also check what consequences your actions may have on others. I can't help that I'm a privileged white chick, but I can do a better job not to abuse it, and I will. In any good 12-step program, making amends is an important step. I called these two candidates, who lost that election, by the way, last week to apologize and to promise to do better in the future. One of them who still lives here and ran and won in the next election, I've been proud to serve with the last two years. When I pulled her aside last week to make an apology and ask her permission to use this story, she hugged me, she cried with me, she forgave me, and she asked if she could be here this morning. So Berdetta snuck in during the children's thing. Could you just wave, please? <laughs> the other one lives on the East Coast now, and we had a phone conversation. He was gracious, and he was grateful to me for the call. It was a difficult conversation for us, and it was a very important one for me. A very wise next door neighbor when I was little, I'm sure he was a hundred years old when I was seven. <laughs> My sister's sitting here nodding, she knows exactly who I'm talking about. He uh, taught the neighborhood children a lot of things, but among them was how to apologize properly. And we had to memorize it and we had to say it again and again and again so that when we needed it, we knew how to do it. And if we didn't say it when asked, we didn't get the Hershey's Kiss or the marshmallow that was today's treat. So here goes. Berdetta Hodge and Vikas Srivastava, I'm sorry, my fault, forgive me, God bless you, I love you. I am a privileged white chick. That is something I have come to learn slowly over time, but particularly here at VUU. I've learned that living with white privilege does not mean beating myself up, but it does mean that I have a greater responsibility to expand my crowd. I've learned that having exchanges with a Southern Baptist black church and marching as an LGBT ally and breaking bread with Muslims and Hindus and being a part of this community and creating more space with which we can expand our crowd and its wisdom is how we expand our personal and collective faith formation. Aristotle said that it is possible that the many, though not individually good men, yet when they come together may be better, not individually, but collectively, just as public dinners to which many contribute are better than those supplied at one man's cost. And so we are, as a family of UUs, when we come together better collectively. We make better decisions when we do it together. We sign more petitions. We feed more people. But we can make even better decisions, take even wider action when we do it together with others. The more we are with others, befriend and work with others, the more we widen our circle, the fewer others there will be. The more wisdom we receive, the more of it we can share. I hope that you will continue to be my crowd and help me to expand it, and that we continue our introspection and good works, each of us sent together, long into my old age. May it be so.